Eva Clarja, August Falsha, Hig, um, Sword Column Killer, Erdus. Um, you're welcome to Swords Historical Society's Centre in the old Carnegie Library in Swords. We've been here since 1988 and we've um, a collection of photographs and artefacts and a museum and genealogy centre. But the idea today is to add to our commemoration of the 1916 Rising and we have done research on the local St. Columkill's graveyard and we discovered that there's at least 26 people there who are actually involved in the Rising. And I, we want to bring it up to date and make connections with the school. So I'm going to introduce you to Dr. James Bennett, who was the headmaster in the school. He worked there for over 40 years. And um, my personal opinion of Jim was that I, I've known a lot of teachers that were there that came, have come and gone, but he, he, he was very interested in local history, more swords than the swords people themselves. And he made sure all the lads knew all about the past and he's done several projects with them. So he's, I, I think he's no better man now to tell you a little bit more about the links with the school that we hope to bring in on the graveyard. Now, Bernadette has mentioned that there are over 20 people who were involved in 1916 buried in the graveyard in Swords. And we have to, while we wish to be inclusive, we obviously have to be selective as well. So we don't mean any offence if we concentrate on people who lived on the main street or its hinterland and are attended the Newborough Boys School. That's the school of which I was proud to be principal when it became St. Colum Kills BNS. And to link the 1916 era with the present, uh, there's a plaque in our school since 1968. It was on the 50th anniversary of the death of one of the people involved, Richard Coleman. And the other link with that is that it was unveiled by uh, Eamon de Valera Uchtaran Ahern. Now, because we're looking at the links between past and present, we're going to look at the main street and what it was like for the people who lived there. We have some beautiful photographs. Bernadette has them here in the Historical Society. Well, uh, this is a picture of Swords Main Street. We're going to show a couple of them here. And it's just to give an idea of, um, they were taken at the turn of the 20th century and they give an idea of what Swords was like in 1916. Um, that particular one, if you look straight down, you can see um, a house with a lot of trees on it, which belonged to people called Duffs who were involved in the Rising. And this is from the top of the town. The um, one on the left-hand side was belonged to people called Walches, who were pump borers, and they were related to Coleman's, which we'll be mentioning a lot later on. Um, the attached one on the right-hand side was Howard's the Butchers. That's North Street, I don't know. Oh yes, well on the corner we had uh, Ryan's Forge, which were later belonged to Julia Weston and Tom Cena, which we'll be talking about. Well this is, I think, must be a very old photograph of Swords Castle because um, all the old, old photographs we have in the collection, there was always a gap there beside the pub, which is gone now as well. You can see it there on that one. But those people coming out, you see the castle uh, belonged to Cobbs of Newbridge House and they would look like associates of the Cobbs. But that was a attached house and of course they were a regular thing in swords. The pound was of course part of the castle domain. It was originally the pound where they they um, took in stray animals and you had to pay a, a fine for having them roaming around the street. Well that of course as we knew it when we were growing up was Pentony's Mill. It was also belong, all belonged to the castle domain. It was a corn mill where um, people brought in their corn to be to be. Um, processed. But it, it was all knocked down in the 1970s I think and it's now the Castle Shopping Centre. This is an interesting one, it's a very old one of Taylor's The Star and the, peep, the one at the side was that would be in the 1930s because they, they were Fagans, they were saddle makers and it was a kind of a place where all the old fellas used to go in and chat and it was knocked down to make the chapel lane wider and 
Taylor's, how it looks quite good there because there that's the original star which was burned by the Black and Tans. That's what that picture is about. And you can see that it's very new looking in the other one because I think people got compensation afterwards when their places were burnt by the Black and Tans. Swords House, which for generations was the home of the Taylors of Swords, but the connection with 1916 is that the Coleman family worked there. Um, that's, there's a record on their headstone. Uh, they're, they're, they're were, they worked for the Taylor family in Swords House. This one is... Um, what we used to call the gut. It was a little road. It's still there. It's, it's McDonald's is on the corner of it now. It's a little road between the main street and um, the Malahide Road. <clears throat> the interesting one, the first one, was where um, Kit Morn that we mentioned, who was in the Battle of Ashbourne, he lived there. And we talked about the different backgrounds of these people who were in the Rising. Kit's father was actually the RIC sergeant in sorts for a while. So that was where they lived. I found about 25 or 26 people buried there who were actually in the Rising. There are a few more that came to live in Swords and are buried that have interesting stories, so we'll mention them as well. And I, I think it's a nice way to remember them, Jim. It is what indeed. do you think? It is yeah. indeed. And, yeah. and we'd say we're linked, and we, and we obviously have the church, we have the graveyard, yeah. the schools, yeah. and it's, a very nice, it's very nice. Now, it will also give us reasons why we may have to speak about some and not speak about everybody yes. but we will list everybody and yes everybody will yeah. be listed but we yeah. can't do the same level of detail no, on no, everybody so no. we, we don't mean any offense no by excluding any anybody that's right okay that's right so i think yeah. that, that that should yeah. be our mission for this morning yeah so well, where yeah. Are we yeah well this one is the nearest gym so maybe we'll go there first so it's it's um a man called Pereirly who actually fought at the battle of ashbourne and i only came across information on very recently by accident and uh, then I found out that the headstone was here. Very good. Now, is that early from the main street? They were from the main street, but not the ones you're thinking of, I I'm think. thinking of a hotel, yeah. No, well, no I, th I think they were, they were farmers, and they lived on the main street as well. And uh, <coughs> I remember <coughs> just an anecdote a long time ago when we used to, I interviewed old Joe Savage. He used to talk about somebody called the Wretch Early, who used to drive a pony and trap, and he used to keep beating the the horse and saying you're rich. You're rich, that's right. That's and I think got the that name. might have been another family. I'd say they were cousins of the other people right. okay. because uh, I, I, I came across a photograph of this man and he looked very well dressed and that, so I'd say they weren't, you know, they could have been farmers as well, you know. Okay, so that's our first one. Yeah, that's the first very one. Good. Very good. And uh, as I said, I, I, I came across it um, by accident. He, he, some, some, the, none of the family live around Swords now, but we, we're in touch with them. Some um, guy emailed me to say that his grandfather came from Swords. And this man's son is still alive. He's 80 something, but they don't live around here at all. But they've been in touch, so they were delighted that, that we mentioned them, you know. Yeah. But he, they, he was one of the ones who fought in the Battle of Ashbourne. Yeah. And the, the, the headstone is so near the church, that's how you know that no, they're all sorts of family. families. They yeah, all are very close family. to the church. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Now, our next one, Bernie, is Taylors, I think. Am I right? Yeah, well, all the Taylors have very, the various headstones here up the top of the hill. So there were three of the Taylors in the Rising. So we'll talk about them now. We'll okay. go up and have a look. Yeah. The one that I see, what the name is very plain on, is Thomas Taylor. And he was the eldest of the Taylor family. And he seems to be very much in evidence in a lot of reports you see about the Rising. And then there was Joseph, who was... Um, uh, he's mentioned as uh, as well. He um, died young. I think well, he he fought at the but they all fought at the Battle of Ashbourne. I think he died in his twenties. And then uh, there was Christie, who was the man that used to run the what we used to call the warehouse on Swords Main Street. So there, the the, the three tailors, and the, then as well as that, some of the daughters were, we were in common on as well. I think they were all a very Republican family at the time, Indeed. you know. No. And the, the pub like was eventually burnt by the Black and Tans in 1922, you know. So. Strong links. Now, Joseph Taylor has a has a family link with yourself. Not right. I saw I saw in the witness statement where he called a pony a trap for your dad. That's right. Yeah, James. Yeah, yeah. it was like as if they were going around uh, telling everyone it was on. Making and the boys went along. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, telling them that the, that the, the rising was on. The fact that the RIC barracks was next door. That's right. And, and that Mrs. Taylor's relations were so good with them. Yeah. That they warned her when yeah. the pub was going to be burned down. Yeah. That they actually gave yeah. her a word, you know, to get but the to get, out. Yeah, but to get back to 1916, I was. 
reading those, you know, those old um, Irish independents that they brought out that you collect. Oh yes, them. I have them. Yes. And, and there is one. It says on it says on the Wednesday of uh, of the rising that um, Thomas Ash walked up and he he walked into the RIC barracks and held it up with um, that Dr Hayes, and then eventually all the other guys appeared, and then they broke in and got into the the um, the, the post office next door as well. And then there's something, and it said that there, there happened to be a, a horse-drawn uh, bread van coming down the town, and the commandeer that took, that, yeah. took all the bread over and put it in their own car and went off down to Donabay. The one we've come to, uh, up to now, we've been talking about people who are natives of the town, Bernadette. That's Arthur right. Arthur P. Agnew you, has a very interesting biography. Yes, he, he, he's not a native of the town, but he, he has a very interesting story to do with 1916, and you can see his family have a beautiful wreath there on the grave. But... Uh, Arthur Agnew came over from Liverpool to fight in the GPO or in, in Dublin in 1916 and he was one of the people who lodged in Kimmage on land belonged to Count Plunkett and they became known as the Kimmage Garrison. So he fought in the GPO and he ended up then like a lot more of the guys in Frongock camp. And just to, to, to tell you how he came to be in swords, um, he became very friendly with the Kellys that I mentioned before, Peter Kelly and Jack Kelly in particular, uh, from the Rathbeel Road. So eventually he he came he he went back to I I think the family were from Belfast originally. He got married in Belfast, and then in the 1940s he came and settled in swords because he knew um, Kellys. the Kellys. Right. And the the first thing he did, I, I'm not sure where they lived, they did end up living in Seatown Villas, but I know, I'm not sure where they lived before, but he did run the post office down on North Street at one stage, and he was very, I remember when I was a child, uh, he, he, he was very active, like Paddy Gerrard is in the church now, he was very active around the church, doing things in the church, that, and very nice, quiet kind of man, so that was Arthur Agnew, and um, we're delighted they sell, they all settled here, his, his family are still around, and some of them are fairly well known as well, we uh, uh, she yes. uh, could w w recognize the name his son Arthur who only died early this year was a beautiful singer tenor he had <coughs> he had won uh, the fesh kill a couple of times and he used to sing in the choir here in the church and when I was a child Arthur was was big and uh, we used to have the 40 hours uh, celebration every year and Miss Bell who was the teacher she always got very worried if Art didn't turn up to Arthur sing the song well. yeah, to, or, to, or to sing the song yes, yes yeah. Yeah, yeah so then of course his son David now is quite famous as a musician and you, you, he's, he's, he's well known married, you, you, to, twink, isn't married right? to twink that's right and the daughter and is the daughter Chloe, is Chloe. So she could, she could and miss it Chloe yeah I was talking to Chloe at the launch of one of the things earlier on and I said to her you know you have it on both sides you know so she's a nice girl so she, she I said I remember your grandfather singing the choir so she was very interested you know you so that's who Arthur Agnew is. Now up to now Bernadette we've looked at uh, men so I think it's very important in terms of balance <laughs> oh, yes, that we, that we see the, the role likes to come in the man yeah. and the women had in the yeah, rising so yeah. we've now come to a Western grave. Yeah well this is the grave of Thomasina Linders who is a Western and her sister Mary Julia Weston. Yeah, we were just we were just saying that uh, Thomasina Linders. Well, she was a Westerner. L Linders is is not is an unusual name as well. I think they came in at one stage. If I'm not making a mistake, they came to live on Lamb Bay Island. But Thomasina, Jim, like it's it's derivation of Thomas, I suppose. That's right. Oh, that, that was a Scottish tradition yeah. where the girl took on the father's name. Yes. I mean, the yeah. most up to date in terms yeah. of the, would be the former Chancellor of the Exchequer in, in the UK. Yeah. Nigel Lawson. His daughter's name was Nigella. That's so it's it's the, the same. same, time, the, same yeah. the same. Well, you get Georgina. Georgina, yeah, Georgina yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah. Patrice. And Henrietta. Patrice, yes, yes, yeah. where, the father's, where, yeah. where there was a feminised version yeah. of the yeah. father's name. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Now, um, if you were like me and you went to school in the in the 1940s and 50s and so on, you would have bought your sweets at the little sweet shop at the corner of the Sea Town Lane. Cobstoppers and, and things. And all these, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Honey Bee and all, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like little did we know at the time that these two uh, old ladies, like that looked as if butter wouldn't melt in their mouth, were there with the shop. But I have looked up, like they were very active in, in coming them on and. Um, 
Oh, they, they, they like if to read their witness statement and that they, they were, um, and then of course they were. Uh, their brother was Charles Weston, who who was one of the leaders over at the Battle of Ashbourne as well. So um, I, I, they're not, they, they're not really from Swords. They're from Turvey. So I think they would that they were baptized in. Um, Donabate, they would have been in Donabate Parish, and they're they're linked up then with another family that's prominent. Their mother was a McAllister. So if you look at a lot of these people that were in the 1916 rising around here, they all seem to be connected with each other. And each other. Yes, I you know, so yeah. so as I said, um, Mary Julia and and uh, and Thomas Cena, as I said, I remember these two little old ladies, little benign ladies like that, that and like to read what they did, you wouldn't think they had it in them, but they, they did their bit. For the freedom and, and, of and Ireland, and, and as well, yeah, yeah, that up to date as well. Yeah, Charlie Weston, the yeah, independent that's reporter, right. would be would be related. He would, they would be, they'd be his grand aunts. Grand aunts, that's right. That's related. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so that's very interesting because yeah. it's very important in terms of balance. That's that right. we include that, the women that, when, that, when we're talking that's about That's right. This. Yeah, and then before, before how they came to have that shop, it belonged to when I was very small. There was an old lady called Mary Ryan owned it, and they, they the Ryans were there for generations. And I think I, I'm not sure. I, I looked. I didn't get a chance to finish researching how they were related. But the thing about eventually Paddy Weston, who's who's Charlie's father now, that that you mentioned he eventually owned it it was left to him and i looked up um his baptism and mary ryan was his godmother right so i think that this is this is the connection but they owned that shop there for generations and they also owned the local forge ryan's forge was at the corner there so they're, they're quite a historic family even though they, they're we wouldn't call them old swords, the swords but, but I, i'd say because they were so long down in the shop they probably bought the grave here and that's how they're there so we're delighted to have them no, here it's, it's lovely yeah it's lovely yeah. to recognize and, yeah. and to get in terms of balance. Exactly. Yeah. Now, now, just as we're yeah. leaving yeah. this section of the graveyard, yeah. I know there are a few people that are very close to you that you want to mention. Yeah. Uh, Alva Mwinnikon in particular is, is a person yeah, uh, Alvin, well, Mr. Monaghan as well. Yeah, Alvin Winnicott, and I only found out, I didn't know he was buried here. Uh, and uh, Alvin Winnicott, Alvin Winnicott, as well, first, a cliche, more idiot. Alan in son Gorham School of Sword Columkilla Nora B. Misha. Well, it's all good. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, rule, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Misha can't you get again? Yeah, it's his man called Alvo Minicon or Alfie Monaghan. He, he came from Belfast and um, he was very, very active in Republican places. He was active uh, down in um, Galway all the time, second in command to Lee Mellows. And he, 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 he has a witness statement which is worth reading. He he didn't. He ended up like between Hutton and Tron, not going to jail. He it says he went on the run and he changed his name and he seems to have been going all over Ireland doing things for the IRA and that. But eventually, <coughs> in how we knew him here <coughs> in the 1950s, <coughs> he came to teach. <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> He came to teach art in the local technical school. <coughs> we were there, but we always called him Mr. Monaghan, but he was Alva. And he, he was an artist. He was a, graph, a graphic artist, not a graphic artist. didn't have those then. I think that's only on computers, isn't it? But <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he was a wonderful artist, and he used to write children's books, Oskelka, and um, all, he worked with Brian O'Higgins. The, the, you might remember when you were young, all these lovely Christmas cards we used to get with all the Irish design, book yes. held designs. And Brian O'Higgins was also a of 1916 cabin man but Alva Winnicott worked with him eventually he, he he another thing I found out lately he was also on the committee uh, that built that uh, erected the the, um, the monument over Nashbourne that he was on the oh, committee. Oh, the Sean T. O'Kelly. Yes, <coughs> Although he, he was a member of that committee right, okay. as well. And <coughs> he, he, he ended up living in Swords over on the Rathfield Road, and we knew him. And we, like, he used to come in every week to teach us art, and he was always us scale again. And he, he, he was wonderful. He used to teach us a lot of general knowledge as well when we'd be painting and whatever we got up to. But he was a lovely man. Right, Bernard, <laughs> we've come to the Kelly grave now. Yeah. Or O'Kelly. O'Kelly, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, Pather O'Kelly, August Jack Kelly, who was known as the Dodger. There were two brothers from the Rathfield Road and their families are still uh, around. I went to school with one of the daughters. But um, <coughs> Pather was um, a lieutenant, I think he called himself, in, in, in the, at the Battle of Ashbourne. And Pather was, uh, uh, he, he always used his name, Oscar Now the other brother, Jack, 
who was known as the Dodger. He was one of the ones that was sent into town. You, you know, you, we know the story of, of, of um, the rising here that the 20 of the men were sent into Dublin to fight. That's right, into the GPO into the first. GPO first. And, and then sent on and to then, the But he, he was one of the ones that was kept in the GPO because right. he was a huge, big, tall fellow, I believe. Big and man, they man. wanted somebody to break holes in walls and, and, be able to dig uh, as and well. make yes, their way yeah. down to yeah. Henry Street yeah. as yeah. they did. So that's Jack, uh, the Dodger. And he, as I mentioned before, he's the man <clears throat> that um, Ag Arthur Agnew got to know and consequently came to live in Swords. So that, that's, that's uh, the Pather. And then Pather eventually... Um, the, th the thing about these people who are they, very sad, if you read it up, uh, Pather was uh, a civil servant and he lost his job because he'd been in the Rising, and which happened to a lot more of them. But uh, a long time, eventually he was reinstated, I think. But uh, I remember him um, like an elderly man when I was a child, as I said, went to school with his daughter but that day are two more now who are very prominent in 1916 yeah. and uh, they would have gone to school here in swords and that's that right, well, like, that I, right. Yeah, I can link up that because yeah. both Jack and Potter won the f what was called colloquially the fee, the fee. It was a kind of a scholarship scheme that's right, the yeah. correct name for it was an exhibition yeah uh, the older of the two lads won it in 1901 and the other boy won it in 1910 yeah now if you won the fee in 1910 Mm -hmm. and was still in primary school or the end of primary school now they went to school longer so he might have been 14 or 15 he was a very very young man yes to be involved in the rising in 1916 yeah but they, they did go to school longer because do you remember when we found the old roll books they had some classes where they used to go in on saturdays and some of them were 15 and 16 years isn't that right that's they, right so, there was a seventh and an eighth yeah, class and you yeah. see because there was no post primary schools that's right there was just yeah, there. Yeah. and yeah. the other, other thing was yeah you had to be careful the year of the fee yeah because there were only three fees yeah. so you stayed it as long as you gave yourself yeah. a chance of winning it yeah so yeah. you, one year might be very bright yes. so you stead the following yeah. so both of those lads won the famous fee and just if i can fill it in as well the three prize in the fee the first prize was 18 pounds the second prize was 15 and the third prize was 12. that was phenomenal money because yeah. i link it in for you i started teaching in 1969 on 12 pounds a week so if you go back 100 years and you're winning a prize worth a 80, lot of money a significant yeah, amount and it made a serious yeah. start to a person in life yeah and the other thing worth mentioning there you see catherine kelly their mother she was also a wilson so they're connected with Peter Wilson, who was killed in the Mendicity. That's right, the carrying same, a white flag. The same family, yes. Northern Mercy, yeah. carrying a white yeah. flag, they reckon he yeah. was shot in the back coming out that, of the Mendicity when he was trying to surrender. That's right, okay. that's right, yeah. Now, Bernadette, as we're after leaving the old part of the graveyard, I think it would be remiss of us not to mention your late dad, James. <clears throat> that's right, yeah. And uh, he's buried over there under the tree and uh, with the Marxists and my mother is buried down here and that's a funny family story that we won't go into now <laughs> but uh, she didn't want to be buried with the Marxists or something. All right, okay, that's well, fair enough, everyone that. to their own. No, yeah. they, they weren't, they weren't, no, it was just something that happened over a grave and it, right. it, I make it funny, you know me. But that's, but yes, my father and he was a, I don't know, I, I've never had a conversation with him. Unfortunately, I was only six months old when he died. Oh, he was a good, a lot older than my mother, you and, see. Yeah. But uh, he must have been always talking about it because my mother was always telling me what he told her and with all this stuff online now I found she was quite accurate in a lot of the stuff she said and, and, and that about him you know but he was he was uh uh, like if you feel, maybe we'd put a photo, some photographs in later. He was a mad-looking young fellow with a big head of black curly hair. The Marxists all had black curly hair. But I, I'm not sure where they came from in Swords. Like I can go back three generations here, but you get the name a lot up from the north, you know. That's right. And That's then right. the other side of the family, Mammy's mother uh, was a Cleary, and they're actually related to the Colemans that we're going to talk about. Right. So that, that's another connection in my family, you know. But my father ended up being one of the guys that was sent into town into Dublin and to the mendicity and he was sentenced to death and uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm always saying it's a good job it was commuted to penal servitude otherwise I wouldn't be here. There you are Bernadette, <laughs> these are the joys. Yeah so this is it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and yeah. the other one um, James Hearn James Herden is Liam. Liam is a member of our committee. Yeah, James Herden was only a young fella. Um, of the family originally came from Carlow, and I think they lived around the North Strand. And he was about sixteen in, in nineteen sixteen. He should be saying this himself. <laughs> and uh, the, there is a picture. Um, Liam always says there's a picture if you ever saw that film Mish Era, and you can see O'Connell Street and this young fella running across to the GPO. And he says a feeling it might have been, might his, have been his father oh, because yes. this is what. But he he eventually was was he he was he ended up in in Frongoch and Ballykinner and all these places. But why he's buried here in Swords is his wife was um, Stacia Howard, whose mother 
I think was a lawless. So that's the connection again. So back so, again to the connection. You know, so there, there, was, there was all this connection. So that that's how James Harden came to be buried here. And just the two, Bernadette, because both of them are prize winners of this famous fee as well that we should mention again. That's right. Was it yeah. Christopher Morn. Yes. And. Christopher Nugent. Now, that Christopher Moore wasn't known as Christopher. He was known as Kid, isn't that and right? Yeah, or Fooster. Or Fooster. Fooster. Oh, lovely, lovely. Fooster, yeah. 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 We're, now, we're now down at yeah. uh, Richard Coleman, the Coleman grave. Now, I think you want to say something about Richard first. Yeah, well, this is the old Coleman grave. His, 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 I'd say that Thomas Cole, Thomas Coleman would have been his grandfather and Margaret Coleman. And uh, they, you see, it says that they died at Swords House. They seem to have been uh, involved with, with the tailors of Swords. Well, they were servants. And, 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 yeah. Cor and Colonel Foster and uh, that, but um, uh, Richard or Dick Coleman, as they called him at the time, was was, was in the in the uh, Rising. Um, he was when when Commandant Connolly asked for reinforcements. That's James Connolly. James Connolly. Yes, yeah, well, yes. that's the director. Yes. Commandant yes, Connolly. Yes, you know, James yes. Connolly. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, um, Thomas Ash um, picked out twenty. He was looking for forty men, but he could only afford to, to send twenty. And Richard Coleman was the leader of these guys who went into town. So I believe they like this. My father was an included. They walked from Noxedan in through Dublin, in through Fairview, and down O'Connell Street, and into the G. And then Richard Coleman and I don't know five of them I think ended up going to the Mendicity and others were kept elsewhere around. As I said, the Kelly guy that was breaking down walls, the big fella. But um, uh, Coleman, they they all ended up in uh, Lewis Prison. Uh, the, these they most of the guys you now the records seem to show that most of the guys that were in um, Ashbourne ended up in Frongock, but my father it was in Lewis Prison and Coleman and, and De Valier and a lot of them were all there and Thomas Ash because they I think they they were in town I think they were caught first and that they were they were court martialed and that and as I said sentenced to death, but it was commuted to uh, penal servitude, but um, Rich they they. Uh, and as I said, the guys from Ashbourne weren't they? They were let out after a few months, a lot of them. But my father didn't come home with a lot of these, and probably Coleman, till June 1917. And uh, the, the thing about my own father now, just to talk, why I keep Coleman's because somewhere along my granny on my mater, my mother's side, uh, was a Cleary, and there's some connection between the Clearys and the Coleman. And, Coleman. Okay. and you know, they like they were all, I suppose, it was the same in every town. And people didn't move around so much, probably were all related to each other. But, but, um, uh, Richard Coleman, when he came home, he became uh, like he was involved again and he was on the run and he was arrested again. And then he was he ended up in a prison called Usk in North Wales. And in 19, um, 18, 1918, 1918, that's right, yeah. Conditions he, were horrific yeah, there. Terrible. Horrific. He, he got pneumonia and uh, he died. Uh, yeah, and uh, no, there is another big Coleman grave, all written on scale, go up further, and it's mentioned that Richard's brother called Philip or Phelim, and he was also involved in, in the Rising, and he died at 24 years of age. I think he was in some kind of an explosion or something as well, but he he died young, but he's buried there as well. Phelim Coleman, he would be buried. But this uh, Richard is not is is not buried here. You can see that the little plaque there that his nephew who was also rich dad he was very devoted to all this he used to come out to me and he's only a couple of years dead but I'm, I'm still in touch with his daughter like she, she comes out but uh, he put that plaque there just to remind people that he was in because a lot of people thought he was buried in swords that he's in the republican plot in glass yeah, yeah. well, and uh, you have a connection with well, the, can, with yeah, the school can, yeah. as well i can fill out a bit there yeah I mean, richard's dad yeah. john was a was a monitor yes now a monitor was an untrained teacher yeah before teachers went into training colleges yeah and there would have been a bit of class distinction the monitors always got hardship from the inspectors oh, right. rather than the trained teachers yeah. and uh, Richard was, I mean, he went to be a priest, he went to be a Christian brother and so That's on. That's right. But yeah. His, yeah. When his nephew called to see me, there's a very fine plaque yeah. outside our mm. uh, the, our staff room. And I asked about the province of it. And what he explained to me was that the family didn't want it outside in case it was vandalised. Yeah. And it was erected in 1968 on the 50th anniversary of his uncle's death yeah. by 
Eamon de Valera. Mr de Valera came here to Mass, an elderly man at the time, didn't yeah. want any publicity, and went up then and That's unveiled right. the plaque. Yeah. And I met yeah. Richard on a number of occasions. Yeah. Lovely man. A lovely, Lovely yeah. man, yes. and his daughter as well. Very, yeah, uh, Kira. Kira, yeah, yeah lovely. Yeah. And yeah. got great detail, yeah. uh, insight yeah. into the person, not as a military man, yeah. but as a person. Yeah. Uh, lovely man. And I mean, it was said of the family, because, mm. and Richard was saying, that the Coleman's were small but numerous. That's right. That they were all small in stature, and yeah. there's a lot of them in it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's lovely to, to recognise yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the leaders of the, yeah. of the rise. Yeah. Oh, Bernie, that was a very, very interesting morning. Yes, it was, wasn't it, Jim? Yeah, yeah. I, well, of course, as you know, I grew up listening to all these names and all these people, so it's, it's nice to kind of put a face on them, so to speak, and let people know a little bit more about them. But um, uh, there are, as I said in the beginning, we found at least 20 six people, I think, who are buried here. So we couldn't, we'd be going around all well, day. We intend not to put them on know, a scroll, isn't that right? We're, I, going, to, we're going to recognize the names, everybody. The names are all, will all be yeah. scrolled. Yeah, there were, there are another, there's names like Stafford and, and like equipped, there's a lot of them around the town still and, and different names like that. So, um, yeah, I think we've done our best to, to, to honor these men. Well, this, of course, is the Swords of 2016. I don't know what some of these guys would think of it um, if they were to come back. But the difference is Swords was a market town, hence the big wide street that you will see in the old photographs. That, of course, is um, the plaque to Richard Coleman and Coleman's shop was there. His mother kept the shop and that's the star today which is sadly going out of the hands of the tailors they have sold it I believe and that is the plaque to Peter Wilson who who was killed in the Mendicity Institute and he lived up that's Bridge Street he lived up there on the green that's why the plaque was put there <laughs> <laughs> 